I feel we're only here as humans because of the good graces of all that's come before us. We need to give back all that we take from Mother Earth. And, and we can, and we can do that beautifully, and we can enrich our soils and make things even more biodiverse. That's Tierney Tice. I'm Cara Duffy, and this is the Powerful Ladies Podcast. Welcome to the Powerful Ladies Podcast. Thank you for having me. I was so excited to get to meet you very briefly at Mountain Film Fest, where my colleague Kendra and I got to sit through a really great conversation between yourself and Carol Dunham and, uh, I'm always going to say her name wrong. Uh, Nalini Nedkarni. Thank you. Yes. It's (laughs) like, you have to hear it a couple of times for it to sink in and I have. Um, but it was such a powerful conversation. You guys each had your own uh, short and then a great conversation about how life doesn't always go your way. And mm-hmm. immediately, Kendra and I were like, we have to talk to them. Like they, not only did you leave great impressions at Mountain Film, but when you look at everything you're doing, I'm a busy person and I'm like, how does she do it? Like you are at level 500 of the <laughs> things you're involved in, the impacts you're making. So I'm really excited to get into you know all those spaces today, um, but let's just start by telling everyone your name, where you are in the world today, and mm-hmm. what you consider yourself up to right now. Oh well, that's that is challenging because I'm as you mentioned, there's a lot of projects um, that I'm up to, but I am coming to you from Carmel, California, on the um, west coast in Monterey Bay, and um, my name is Tierney Teese. And what am I up to? Well, a lot of my time is um, dedicated to a new, non- well, a, a nonprofit that I co-founded with Carol Dunham, who's also been on your on your um, podcast. Yes, um, called Around the World in Eighty Fabrics, and this nonprofit is really dedicated to elevating the voices of makers and communities dedicated to creating non-petroleum natural, sustainable fibers and clothing. And um, I came into that work rather circuitously um, because my training is a marine biologist. Mm -hmm. I've always been captivated by the natural world and um, did my my doctoral work in in, um, biomechanics and fish swimming and and, um, love marine biology and marine conservation, but kept seeing my study sites fill up with plastic. And my study animals filling up with plastic. And then this epiphany that our clothing is 60% petroleum <clears throat> was was jarring. I opened my closet and I'm like, oh, there's an oil spill in my closet. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I, I, I just was curious, how did that happen? Mm-hmm. And um, what could we do to, to lessen our footprint that has been brought about by fashion? And as a marine conservationist, I just found that fashion brought me to audiences that were totally unconverted. Yeah. And um, and I I like to call it the Trojan horse of every environmental issue. So Mm -hmm. I'm not a fashionista, but I could see it as a vehicle for touching on so many things that are important to humanity, Mm -hmm. whether it's the health of our soil or... Um, social justice for fair wage for workers, or carbon sequestration, um, biodiversity. Yeah. So I am. Um, it's intellectually fascinating. The world of textiles. It's socially empowering, and I think it's such an exciting, optimistic time. Mm-hmm. So um, our nonprofits. It's um, educational, and we have interns, and they leave. You know, they come in, you know, so depressed and paralyzed by what's wrong with the world. And they leave excited and empowered. <laughs> so. That's a nice tangible result. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I feel that's really one of the most important um, is is showing that that, you know, that there is hope, that we can mm-hmm. take these restless creative minds, eight billion minds of ours, mm-hmm. and we can forge a beautiful future for ourselves. Um, and that is possible because we see it. 
We see it with maker community and maker community, regardless of culture or geography or, you know, uh, creed, color, everything. We see it yeah. across the globe. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a universal desire to, to live a healthy life and, and um, we can be united in that front. Well, and I think what's so unique too is that there's room. So like I, my background was working in footwear and apparel for 20 years and yeah. struggling with the guilt of like, we're just making more stuff. How do we, like yeah. we tried so many times to be pushing through sustainability and like there are layers mm -hmm. of it and the brands have been trying for a long time, probably the wrong way. So I'm glad things are starting to change with how they are. Mm -hmm. But hearing you talk about that and biomechanics, I'm like, yep, we could talk about biomechanics all day mm -hmm. <laughs> if you wanted to. But there's this desire to save the planet and save us ultimately, not really the planet. The planet will probably be fine. Yeah. Um, but um, to do what's right for all the collective communities and spaces that are impacted, but also have this self-expression and beautiful component. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, when we, when we were talking to Carol about around the world in 80 fabrics, there was this, there's so much beauty and artistic and creativity that doesn't have to get lost because we're doing the right thing or the conscious thing. Mm -hmm. um, so right. I think that's, that's a new balance that, as you said, the Trojan horse, mm -hmm. how do we sacrifice nothing while lifting up everything else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I think, you know, it's like the triple bottom line. So, yeah. you know, you have to have a moral, uh, the, you know, a moral part of that mm -hmm. bottom dollar. Mm -hmm. Um, because that's really where deep happiness will come from when you're, you're not, yeah. it's not just money, 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 money. It's, no. you know, the, what's your, what's your larger purpose? And mm -hmm. I have, I have additional projects, research, primary research projects that, that look at that from different, different aspects mm -hmm. as well. So, yeah, I'm a devotee of biodiversity. <laughs> oh, that's a little poem. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, I feel we're only here as humans because of the good graces of all that's come before us. Yeah. And we... We really, I, I, I love, um, you know, Robin Kimler and braiding sweetgrass and these, um, you know, reciprocity. The mm -hmm. we need to give back all that we take from Mother Earth, mm -hmm. and and we can, and we can do that beautifully, and we can enrich our soils and make things even more biodiverse. Mm -hmm. um, we have all those tools. So, well, and I think that's the part that gets frustrating for so many is that we have solutions we have solutions so like I, then the conversation becomes and i think also not to, you know from a this being the powerful ladies podcast there a lot of women are very pragmatic of like if it's broken let's fix it now because we have other things to do <laughs> like yeah there's so many things that have to be fixed and managed and done and yeah. there's like a, how do we do it now like why aren't we just handling this because Hey, by the way, there's going to be a long line of the next thing coming. We know it. Right, right. Uh, um, so I think that's an interesting place as well. Of like, why, why is it taking so long? Why, why is it so slow to fix these things that we have answers for? Yeah, I think that's um, well. You know, there's a lot of personal interests involved, um, mm -hmm. and that's why I think it often gets discouraging, especially for for college. Um, students, you know, how can they even make any, how can they make any headway? Mm -hmm. And that's why I, you know, it's just jump in and start the work and start small and don't, you don't have to, you know, want to save the entire planet, <laughs> save all of humanity in one go. Um, there are certainly some solutions that, that um, are more sil silver bullets than others. Um, but like for instance, getting rid of harmful subsidies when it comes to overfishing, mm -hmm. but, but, um, but I think you just have to start in your community and then work outwards. Mm -hmm. So, I with the with the around the world native fabrics, I, you know, I started. I was mentoring a a middle school team to how to tackle plastics, and we decided we would just make a quilt out of um, non petroleum fabrics and. And that little school project then turned in, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. 
So, but it was just, it's just started small. Mm -hmm. Is that, oh, sorry. Is that how your life has been? Because to brag about you a little bit, you have been a TED speaker. You are a National Geographic Explorer. You're a filmmaker. I also read that you are scuba dive certified, a pilot. Like you're just checking off a lot of fun things (laughs) to do. And have some of those been like big intentional plans of yours or have they all started small in like a, oh, I don't know how I got here, but this is cool. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I've never been one to say, okay, in five years, I'm going to be here. In 10 yeah. years, I'm going to be there. Uh, you know, I've, I've always been open when I see a door open and there's something very interesting in there. One must explore <laughs> <laughs> and see what's in there. Yeah. You've got to go see what's in there. And so, um, so I never would have thought I would be running a nonprofit in textiles. Yeah. No, it was just it was just had to be done. I, you know, we when we put together that quilt, the the um, middle schoolers, I was like, there must be a website or some place where all the all the amazing biodiversity from the mm-hmm. dawn of humanity that we have used to clothe ourselves, there must be a place where it's all housed, and there wasn't, and so I guess we had to make that. So mm-hmm. I, do, I do have the the um, benefit and the luxury of being able to go around the world. Um, to all sorts of places through National Geographic and um, leading tours for them, which I've been doing for many years, and and then I could take advantage and just see all this, all these different cultures and all these different in- ingenious ways of of creating fibers from stems, from seeds, mm. from algae, <laughs> from mushrooms, <laughs> from mushrooms, <laughs> from mushrooms, exactly. Um, yeah. So, so just, um, uh, it's, I don't know how anyone could be bored on this planet. There's just so much to learn and there's mm-hmm. so many interesting questions to be asked. So, yeah, yeah. I, I get upset when I'm like, oh, I won't live in all the places I want to live in. Like it's mm. impossible. Um, and like trial, like there's, I get upset about the, the fact that I can't <laughs> see and do it all. Um, if we go back to eight year old you. Mm-hmm. Would she be surprised with how your life has unfolded, or would she be like, "Yes, this is exactly what we had planned"? Hmm. Well, at eight, let's see. I was living in California. I moved to Vermont when I was ten, and and that's where my my memories really sort of kick into gear because we lived right on the Appalachian Trail. Very cool. And at the age when I was little in Oakland, California, <clears throat> I couldn't explore on my own. Kind of urban. Mm-hmm. When I moved to Vermont, the Appalachian Trail, I could just disappear for hours on my own, on my bike or with my dog. And I just loved that. I loved free ranging, mm-hmm. being out in the wild, gardening, um, jumping in the river, wayfinding through the forest. And there's just something so, so deeply enriching with being in the outdoors and in this you know, life that's been going for 4 billion years. Mm-hmm. Um, and to me, that was just, there's so many questions and and relationships and, um, you know, who's eating whom and who's cozying up to whom. And, <laughs> and it was just so much fun to be outside in that, in that, you know, that vibrant life. And mm-hmm. so I think that, that really, all I wanted to do was study that in truth. And so I am, um, I wanted to be a biologist from, yeah. from really my earliest memories. And um, while I was in Vermont, I remembered growing up in California with this beautiful ocean, which I jump into every day. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> Even though it's very cold here in California. <laughs> um, and, and it's just, I, mean, I just wanted to study biology, life. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do things work? And where do we fit into that grand scheme of species? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what can we do to lessen our footprint? Stepping all over everybody else. <laughs> yeah. My uh, minor was in urban anthropology. And Ooh, interesting. from the, like, why we live where we live and why do certain mm. cultures make it or not? And the question that I've always been really curious about, which ties directly into why this podcast exists, is why do some people succeed against the odds versus others don't? Mm. Like 
you know, and I think that there are so many examples, right, of, of we're given very similar opportunities sometimes. And it's like, who takes which one and why? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm such a, like, I'm such a curious person. I hear that in you. Like, has your curiosity opened doors for you that, like, is it curiosity? Is it liking the risk? Is it liking novelty? Like, what's that core motivator for you that keeps you wondering, like, what's over there? <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um, well, I guess it's it's really when when I have a question and I want to answer it, I kind of figure out how to answer it. And sometimes that requires, um, you know, doing your own primary research. Mm-hmm. So, so I was working on this crazy big fish for like thirty years. I've been obsessed with the giant ocean sunfish, which is it's um it's shaped like this. It's it's a funny looking fish. Um, <clears throat> I think I probably have some stuffed. Oh, yes, I have a stuffed animal. (laughs) That's a giant ocean sunfish. (laughs) Um, So cute. And I just went, I'm like, why are you shaped like this? You get to be 6,000 pounds. But why lose your tail and go into the open ocean? So so that just drove me. and, And then that led to another question, another question. And then another research project I'm involved in um, was when we go outside or when we just look at nature imagery, being a filmmaker, we would you know, capture beautiful scenes. And just looking at beautiful scenes, you'd sort of be like, huh. Even looking at a screensaver of a beautiful mm-hmm. green meadow or, or waterfall. And I was interested in what's going on in our brains yeah. that create that physiological response to a digital image. So that led me to doing um, a research project ongoing with Stanford University and Nick Save in neuro um, neuroeconomics and neuroimaging, um, and tapping into the power of functional magnetic resonance imagery to see what's going on in our brain when we look at something mm-hmm. that's beautiful in nature, and then when we want, when you ask, what would you pay to conserve it? So where do those? How can you harness those different? <clears throat> Um, how can you tweak imagery to generate the most stewardship? That's so interesting. The last book I read last year was The Nature Fix, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is talking all about, you know, forest bathing and is it, do we need to be in nature and for how long to get the benefits versus will an image do it? But I love that idea of like adding the stewardship component to it. Yeah. The conversation, one of the workshops I had at Mountain Film about enchantment, I don't know mm-hmm. if you got to sit in that one, but it was the idea of how we've lost enchantment. But when you have it and you know how magical the fish is or the tree is and, and like having gratitude for the fact that mm-hmm. this magical thing exists, like we just assume like, of course it should exist. It's a tree. And I'm like, yeah, but we don't know on another planet, another, the desert would like a tree would be magical. So yeah. Yeah. coming back to that enchantment component, like you can't not want to protect it when it, um, the magic of it existing is as magical as you existing Mm -hmm. in that same space. Like, are you, from the research you're doing, are you, like, is it leading to more stewardship? Like, if people just look at nature photos, are they more inclined to become environmentalists? Well, there's really fascinating research in that realm. Um, Mm -hmm. We used... We used the nature imagery in various different ways, like with Nalini Nadkarni, who was on that panel with me, who is an absolutely phenomenal person. You should probably put her on your podcast. She's on the list. <laughs> oh, she's amazing. <laughs> I adore Nalini. And um, she uh, she gave a TED Talk. I, 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 I recommended her for the TED stage, and she gave a TED talk on the power of nature and wouldn't it be great if we could put nature where nature's not, especially in solitary confinement prisons. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, a prison officer heard her talk and contacted her and said, I want to do it. And so we then we had another research project up in, um, in Oregon at the Snake River Correctional Institution where we were putting nature imagery into solitary confinement prisons. Wow. Um, and then it had a huge effect, you know, lowered discipline um, referrals, which are very violent often mm-hmm. and costly. And we interviewed the the inmates and they would flash back on those scenes and they could help self-regulate. And it, 
I mean, it really got a lot of media attention and it started to spread with more and more. I mean, it's just Time magazine called it one of their top 25 inventions of 2014, which is kind of pathetic because it's so not rocket science, but it's just a tiny bit of human compassion, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So, so we see it in terms of being able to Mm -hmm. self-regulate in a severely nature deprived environment. There's also studies that have been done in the UK and in Utah that have shown when you watch nature imagery, it actually affects your future discounting. So it actually increases your ability, your your patience and your Mm -hmm. delayed gratification. And um, so we feel, so, and that's, I mean, if we could think more long-term, then that's, for me, that's a silver bullet because Mm -hmm. it's this short-term thinking, this myopia, and our election cycles that promote short-term thinking and, and short-term gain, mm-hmm. that's that's a problem. So anything that can slow us down, get us on planetary time, yeah, um, is, is really a beneficial thing. So with the nature imagery, I was really interested in getting that as recognized in terms of our mental sanity. It's Mm -hmm. not just cleaning our air and cleaning our water and giving us food from our crops. It's actually part and parcel. (laughs) Well, it is absolutely critical to our sanity. Yeah. To have green space and blue space. So, After reading the book, I started um, putting my uh, forest essential oils in when I'm sleeping. And it really has made such a difference in feeling rested when I wake up. Yeah, hinoki and, cypress and cedar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Those yep. phytoncides. The trees mm-hmm. put out these phytoncides and these, and um, and they boost your immune system, your natural T cells. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's good science behind it, mm-hmm. and and we just need to recognize that. I I think you know the the measure of a successful urban environment should be in the capacity to have nature preschools. You know. Yep. Where the, the youngsters could be outside in nature the entire time in some park or, you know, so. And well, it's then working. The, yeah. It's working in the Nordics. It's working in Vermont and parts of California. So. Right, right. Um, it, yeah, I, there's, I'm really, maybe in my next decade, I'll take, I'll work more on the educational part. But like I moved so much growing up and I saw the impact of different size schools and different locations of schools mm. and different access. Like I saw it live happening to me and my classmates mm. and being someone who has always been an entrepreneur, whether I worked in a corporate space or not, and knowing what skills you need to be able to go to a foreign country or make new connections, like figure things out. So much of that's not taught, let alone civics or finance or emotional health mm. <laughs> anymore. Mm. And I do think it's going to be really interesting how how we choose as a society to use those hours we have with kids in school. Of yeah. Like, who do we really want to be creating? Um, right. Yes, we want people doing be able to read and do math and science. And yeah. how are we conditioning them to actually apply it in a compassionate, useful, reciprocal <laughs> way? Right. Um, right. And do we all agree? Um, I, yeah. I think it'll be interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I think um, Robin Robin Kimler, she says, isn't it, isn't the purpose of education to learn the nature of our own gifts and how to use them for good in the world? Love and, that. And I love that idea because mm-hmm. then you're you're um, you're really sort of a gardener as an educator. Yeah. You know, you're gardening well, them and nurturing them. Right, which you know, so much more powerful than here's a bunch of memorization. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and not just instructing from the top down. You're sort of nurturing from the bottom mm-hmm. up. But, I mean, kindergarten. That's what it's. That's what yeah. it translates to. Child <laughs> garden. Yeah. So when I'm not uh, with on the powerful lady side of the business, I'm a business coach and consultant, mm-hmm. and I spend so much of my time helping people unlearn the mm-hmm. things that have removed them from their gifts. Because the easiest way to have the fun and freedom and actually double your revenue is when you're in alignment with just who you are authentically. Yeah. Um, and I look at your, your life path and career path and I really see how great it is. Like when you can just keep saying yes, like, mm-hmm. and was saying yes 
something that you were taught? Was it who you are intuitively? Did you see someone else saying yes to all these fun things and thought, ooh, <laughs> they got the, they have the answer? Um, well, I think it's, I think it's, um, perhaps it's, I always felt like I could, if I could find some way to help, you know, mm-hmm. some, like, if there was something I was interested in, then I'd find some way to help. What what can I add to it? I, I'm not going to be a parasite. I mm-hmm. want to, um, I want to catalog, maybe I bring people together, or maybe I do this part of the work and we collaborate. I mean, I love, I love collaborating. And mm-hmm. that's, um, so, so it was always, well, that's really interesting. Maybe I could help out in this way and we could work together and then, Oh, that's so interesting. <laughs> Let's work together on that. And I can do this this part for it. Mm-hmm. So I think it's maybe having the confidence to feel like there's something I could offer. Mm-hmm. Um, and and then be and then just learn about it. Cause that's that's how you learn about it, is if you're, you know, you you team up and you try to progress on a question. So mm-hmm. so yeah, it does. I hope it. I, I do sometimes look back and I'm like, wow, it, my path goes all over the place. But but it's it's really driven by this desire to protect um, biodiversity mm-hmm. and and all the you know, I just love all the critters that we get to share the planet with. <laughs> yeah, they're endlessly fascinating, and we have we owe them everything, everything, and they get they get left out of the equation. I see. You know, I see people wanting to go to Mars and wanting to go off the planet and and <clears throat> that's all well and good, but it takes resources to do that. And mm-hmm. where do those resources come from? The fact that we're powered up on this computer and mm-hmm. and this phone, then you know, all everything that drives our society, our crude oil our gas, our coal, that came from life. Mm-hmm. Marine plankton, for the most part, when it comes to crude oil. And then, so we run off marine plankton that decayed and transmogrified over hundreds of millions of years. And nobody really appreciates that, you know? They just yeah, think it's oil. But it was life. It was mm-hmm. life that gave us that. Um, so, uh, so I think we we often forget the non-human part of our existence at our peril, because mm-hmm. we are nothing without our non-human compatriots. Yeah, there's not a plankton sustainability club to make sure we have crude oil 100 million years from now. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully we won't, because unfortunately <laughs> that's a Faustian bargain, because <laughs> <laughs> there are other things that we can use now. Um if only we had photosynthetic skin, then we'd really, we'd be set, you know. What do you think is a solution to exposing most people to how dependent they are on the world around them? Mm. Well, I think, you know, this is why I got into this nature imagery, because it's very tangible. When you are, when you're, when you go outside, you suddenly are like, <sighs> I mean, everyone just involuntarily, they breathe a sigh of relief. Their heart rate goes down. Their cortisol levels maybe even out. Mm -hmm. Let's take it out. If you're having a fight, let's take it outside. Let's step outside for a second. (laughs) And, um, And so I think this recognition that we need nature to be sane, I think that's a very powerful message, especially Mm -hmm. as we careen towards being increasingly urban. Mm -hmm. And erecting more and more walls between ourselves and the natural world and making the natural world like even better than reality with these virtual headsets. And um, I think that's all well and good when you can't get outside, but we need to, we need to recognize that being outside is, is critical to our, to our health and having our outsides be healthy. (laughs) So, so I think, um, I think that's really part, uh, important is to, in our urban designs, in our schools, to keep incorporating the outdoors, the microbiome Mm -hmm. of the outdoors. 
and the biodiversity of our of our cropland, you know, mm-hmm. creating whole ecosystems instead of monocultures. Yeah. And we see that with aquaculture, you know, intertrophic multi multi-species aquaculture. We see this creation of multiple species where you can harvest at every trophic level and you create a whole ecosystem. Mm-hmm. And we see this with polyculture, yeah. uh, with multiple crops growing together and cover crops and and crops that bring in pollinators. So we know what to do. Yeah. And we have enough food to feed to feed the world, but um we need to we need to um you know figure out this thing. The mm-hmm. all our vices. We have a lot of a lot of cognitive biases and a t- tribalism, you know, mm-hmm. and these tendencies to just say us and against them. And so I am, um, uh, I encourage everyone who wants to go into conservation, I encourage them to also minor in psychology <laughs> and cognitive science. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. Cause you're, you're selling to people. <laughs> you're selling to people and people are very complicated. Mm-hmm. They're very they're very complicated and they have complicated lives and they carry a lot of baggage. And um and you have to learn how to communicate your messages that resonate with their values and mm-hmm. find common ground. So yeah. No, I, I think it's so interesting to see there's of course social media is helping to make it look bigger than I think participation may actually be, but there's so much conversation about biohacking and being present and doing personal development, which we all need to do so we can listen to the actual things that are happening and deal with ourselves <laughs> and get out of our own way. Um, and, but so much of it is for, it's still for personal selfish components. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I would, the last podcast that we recorded, we were talking a lot about being a, like a service-based leader. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How, like was service, being of service, did it, it sounds like what you've shared so far that it just came naturally to you. Like you couldn't imagine not protecting and saving these things. Was that something that you grew up with having a perspective of, or um, was it just by the simple fact of seeing it not being done that you again had to step into that space because you saw it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of, you know, another braiding sweetgrass leadership should be rooted in service, wisdom, and generosity, not power and, and um, authority. Yeah. If only, you know, <laughs> yeah. And if only success was measured in generosity as opposed to um, bank accounts, you know, mm-hmm. you'd be so much better off. So in my, my upbringing, I mean, I, my my family's always been like huge animal lovers, um, mm-hmm. and I think in um, you know I went to to Brown University and there was such strong social conscience with my mm-hmm. with my um, Brown colleagues. I would just see them doing these incredible projects. Um, at scale, and mm-hmm. it was quite inspirational. And I and I see that a lot in in many um in many liberal arts colleges now. My my um, daughter's heading off to Middlebury, and I've yeah. been so excited yeah. to see all the training um the training material that that's been coming in. And you mentioned unlearning mm-hmm. early in the podcast, and um they have a whole unlearning um part of <laughs> part of their freshman seminar. That's so, so interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's definitely being recognized um, that this is this is you know this is an issue. This is a problem. This is a huge part of our educational upbringing. I, I think in the past, church church had that role, mm-hmm. and yeah. as we become more and more secular, less and less you know less and less people go to church. Um, that 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 you know that community service engagement needs to be needs to be cultivated and nurtured. Mm-hmm. I know I know in my kids school um they have their regu- their community service hours. So I think that's good. I didn't have that when I was in high school. Did yeah. you? No. Only no. got in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we got in trouble. And then, um and then maybe you had to do community service then. But um we never had that as part of our um, part of what we had to do, I did volunteer in, in high school just because mm-hmm. I thought it would be fun. Um, yeah. but, but it wasn't, it wasn't required. So mm-hmm. I think that's, I think that's a good, a good, um, addition. We need more of that. Well, yeah. It's such a great way to see that no matter how old you are, what skills you have, you can be a contribution just for existing. 
Yes. And, yes. and showing up. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah. And how we, um, you know, what what's our gift to the world? Mm-hmm. How can we do good in the world? And it's just, it feels good to do that. Yeah. It just feels good to do that. Yeah. When I think it ties back to what you were saying about how leadership is so often led by power and ego because people mm. don't know what their gift is. They don't know um, right. how powerful they are and what they're capable of doing. So they're, they're, they're filling that hole by taking versus, yeah. um, you know, this leads into a question I ask every guest, which is what do the words powerful and ladies mean to you and do their definitions change when they're next to each other? Mm. Hmm. Well, power is a loaded term, you know, yes. um, <clears throat> and and so, well, I mean, I think powerful ladies uh, is frightening, a frightening term to many, you know, it's um, especially insecure men. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I and I, but I think what makes someone truly powerful in my in my book is their ability to elevate others you know they're not mm-hmm. just this person on the pedestal i i really have a problem with our narrative the hero's journey you know mm-hmm. and because it's always like we have the one person who's going to save us all and then they go through this formulaic transformation they get the muse and then they save us and i think we have to shift that narrative to the one person or the the people that lift each other up and they're not doing it to put themselves on a pedestal and it really frightens me the you know the leaders that we are that could potentially take the helm i don't want to get mm-hmm. into politics <laughs> right now but um but i see antithetical mm-hmm. candidates and that really worries me because it's a terrible role model and it validates yeah. terrible behavior. Um, and role models, they they imprint on our youngsters and they mm-hmm. imprint on everybody. They valid when you when you see horrible behavior glamorized, it, be it in Hollywood or yeah. in the White House, it is so dangerous. Mm-hmm. So. I, I think it. It's really interesting that you brought up the hero's journey because I I use it regularly for working with my clients beca- mm-hmm. and I'm not using it and what I how I use it is reminding them that they are not the hero they are the the Yoda character they are the guide mm-hmm. Be- and um, but it's really interesting to think about it from the perspective that you just shared of like how it's it's like one person because. Again, because I'm, I'm coming from the space of like that service. How do we use that story for the service component? Yeah. Um, like you are the Dumbledore. You are the Yoda in the story. Mm-hmm. You are not <laughs> the main character because we can't be if we want to serve people. And nobody wants to buy in a strictly business communication sense. Most people don't care what you've done or um, who you are. Like no one ever asks me my background, which is hilarious because mm-hmm. Mm. They're paying me to give them advice. Mm. They just want to know how I can, how you can help them. Mm. Mm-hmm. That's the only question that people are usually asking. And so often we think we have to prove ourselves to other people before there'll be a yes to us. But it's the opposite. Well, because um, they're totally <laughs> self-absorbed. Yes. They just want to talk about themselves for the most part. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's so no. funny. It's so yeah. funny you say that because you start. You have to have a certain amount of street cred, mm-hmm. and then they don't care. Then it's all like then it's all about them. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny. It, it reminds we, me. Um, I met a fellow named John Francis. He's he's known as the Planet Walker mm-hmm. because he was walking across the Golden Gate, and there was a terrible oil spill. It was one of the bridges in the Bay Area. I think it was the Golden Gate, and there was there was a um a shipwreck, a crash underneath, an oil spill. And he vowed to go off fossil fuels. And everyone got so upset at him. That's ridiculous. And he would retort, but it wouldn't make any difference. And so he he took a 17-year vow of silence. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, he realized that when you're speaking to someone, you're only listening with half of your 
half of what they're saying because you're already preparing your retort. And so by taking the vow of silence, he said, I was really, I would listen to people, everything they had to say. And I flash on that because I, I do that too. I'm like, oh, blah, 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 blah. and then, and yeah. then I haven't heard half of what you just said. And so I think it's something to keep, you know, to keep reminding ourselves mm -hmm. that um, you don't always have to just jump right back with a, with an answer um, yeah. and just let it sit and listen. <laughs> It's so true. It's it's seventy five percent of negotiation is listening. Mm. Um, it's it's it shows up everywhere. Like present listening isn't happening, yeah. which is. I really wonder if we just focus on present listening, like how quickly could we make whatever impact we want to? Because there's so much tide of loneliness back to not being heard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like there's. It's just being normal, like going back to being just a human. Like, what does a human need? Um, we've we've kind of jumped over all that to, like, humans don't need a car in actuality, mm -hmm. um, but everyone thinks they need one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they need to have like seventeen things going on at once, which mm -hmm. I'm certainly. Uh, um, <laughs> that's certainly been my case and so I was, <laughs> because these make it so easy you know yeah you just work 25 hours a day so um so we you need to constantly like reground like like you said you know take a little rest smell your forest oils go outside <laughs> you know take a breath of fresh air and um, mm -hmm. just reground yourself outside and get it back into that time zone. So, yeah, we have our work cut out for us because we're just we're just yeah. accelerating as a society. Yeah, yeah, we really do. Um, you have been to a lot of countries, I believe, over seventy. Mm -hmm. What are some key takeaways that traveling to so much of the planet has given you insight in mm. or two? <clears throat> Well, that we have so many things in common, <laughs> much more so than our differences. And and the U.S. is not a number one in so many ways. So it's funny. I we go on these, we do these trips where we circle the planet in about a month, and um, and it's always interesting to me the the guests. I'm like, yeah, we have better Wi-Fi in Cambodia. Then we have you know, a lot of places in, in the U.S. Or, you know, the, the airport in Morocco was so much more efficient than many of the airports here. So, so mm -hmm. this realization that, you know, knock the U.S. off its, off mm -hmm. its pedestal, um, I think that's really important. Um, and that there's, you know, there, there's ingenious human, human ingenuity everywhere on the planet, mm -hmm. even in the places where there are so little resources, so little resources. So it's, um, and, and we're all, we have, we have just connections through our architecture, through our foods, through our, mm -hmm. through our wildlife, through our, the migrations of birds that, you know, bring resources across the planet. We're, we're this, you know, like Buckminster Fuller talks about tensegrity, we're just this, you know, networked living systems and, and, and we all, we all rely on each other. You push on one part of the planet and you will feel those repercussions mm -hmm. on the other mm -hmm. side. We are a global species and certainly our supply chains, um, mm -hmm. it's writ large in our supply chains and, and COVID made that very apparent. Mm -hmm. Um, so we do bear responsibility to the home address of many of the things that seem distant. Mm -hmm. that are, you know, that soy sauce on our shelf that we get at the, at the market, you know, that's, you know, that took two years to ferment in Japan and then the plastic came from somewhere else. It, it, we are these global creatures and, mm -hmm. and it's challenging because we evolved as tribal. So this is our biggest, this is our biggest challenge is how to be a good global species. Mm -hmm. 
recognize the common humanity and see if we can work together um, for for the common good. But we have a long way to go. But I, I am I am excited because now with all this AI and with all fake news, mm-hmm. we are and social media mm-hmm. preying on our vices. All the algorithms designed to, you know, hook mm-hmm. us. We are becoming more cognizant of our of our um, of our frailty, of our mm-hmm. weaknesses, of our vulnerabilities. So, like in my kids' school, they're taught how to recognize fake news. So and great. We have to be taught. We're taught. Oh, that's Chat GPT speaking. That's not mm-hmm. you actually writing that essay. So we can identify what makes us uniquely human that cannot be distilled into an algorithm. Mm -hmm. And that's exciting. Um, And how do we augment that with all our technology instead Mm of have it degrade us and dissolve us, you know, dissolve our humanity. So Mm -hmm. we we have our challenges, but I am optimistic because I see, you know, in our fibers and our cultures and, and weaving is such a good metaphor. I just mm-hmm. see when we weave these threads together, we become so much stronger. Yeah. Yeah. What are you excited about for Around the World in 80 Fabrics this year? Oh, gosh. So much. <laughs> <laughs> We're launching a bunch of um, expeditions that guests can come on. Very and, cool. You know, to Mongolia, to Bhutan, to Africa. So a lot of, um, we want to take people to meet our makers, <laughs> to meet your mm-hmm. makers, um, and to get their hands in at how do you make these fibers and fabrics. Mm-hmm. And, and um, so that's very exciting. We also are in the phase of quilting now. It started as a quilt, you know, it was inspired yeah. by a quilt. And now our phase is that um, we've collected hundreds of fabrics from different cultures all over the world. And we're taking them and we're making thematic mini quilts, um, like indigos of the world and cottons mm-hmm. of the world, where each swatch tells a story and has a face behind Love that. And then when you put them together in a quilt, that metaphor is, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's like it's like a process of mending, where we we stitch each other together and we see how we complement each other mm-hmm. and how we strengthen each other. And then when you look back on it, we're this beautiful mosaic, this beautiful mix united by a common theme. And so that's that's what we're aiming towards for, for this, this year is to make the quilts, to launch the expeditions, um, to do a display at Future Fabrics in London at the end of June, which is a great expo. Anyone interested in materials should go to Future Fabrics. Um, yeah, so... Um, those are those are some of our big our our big tasks. Yeah. We ask everyone on the podcast where you put yourself on the powerful lady scale. If zero is average everyday human and 10 is the most powerful lady you can imagine, where would you put yourself today and on an average day? Oh, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> how do I, uh, you're asking me to compare myself to other other powerful ladies or or, or just what number would you give yourself? Yeah. Like are you, where are you, where would you rank yourself on a one to 10 scale? Whatever your comparisons you want them to be or not be. Oh, oh, um, well, I don't know. That's a difficult thing to ask. I guess I, if I took all the powerful ladies that you've chosen and my team at Around the World in 80 Fabrics, Pretty and Leslie and Carol, and we were all together, we'd, I'd put us all up at 11 because we're all together. <laughs> That's a, there, I cheated. <laughs> the, the power of powerful ladies together, right? <laughs> yes, yes. We're all woven mm-hmm. together. And then, then we're doing pretty well, all of us yes. together. And, and my family and, you know, all of us together. Then we, then we, get, we get high numbers. Mm-hmm. If we're just by ourselves and it's not very, not very fun and a lot less productive. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We've also been asking everyone, what do you... What do you need? What do you want? What are you manifesting? This is a powerful, connected, mm. uh, giving community. So what would you like? How can we help you? Oh, well, 
Well, if people want to donate to Around the World Native Fabrics, we we use every penny towards good. Um, yeah, so, um, and we're a tiny nonprofit, so we're always in need of funding, um, really hand to mouth. So that would be terrific. Um, so, and if people are interested in coming on trips with us, we would love to take you around the around the globe to to um, discover that. Um, yeah, I think, um, and I would really just, in, I would hope people listening would would be inspired to go outside more and maybe get a mask and snorkel and put their head underwater because it's a wonderful world underwater um, and it needs help, needs our help. Really, um, and uh, to be conscious about what what we buy and mm -hmm. what we eat. You know, we make such an impact with our consumer choices. Yeah. We've all got too much stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got too much stuff in my closet. So, so I do ask people, what I would love is for people to really, before they buy clothing, to ask themselves, do I need it? What is it made from? You know, mm -hmm. is it made from a bunch of petroleum? Um, <clears throat> do, um, can I get it secondhand? You know, what am I, how, how long am I going to wear it? You know? Is it, is, it, is it something that's going to last? Um, we can take care of our clothing better. So uh, how was it made? Who, who made it? So, mm -hmm. and then you probably, after you ask yourself all those questions, you probably won't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> but then you look at the end of the month, you're like, ooh, I didn't spend all that money on needless clothing that just clogs my closet. We can donate to Around the World in Navy Fabrics. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I have the extra money I was going to spend on some little silly Instagram shot, and now I can donate to a good cause because there are so mm -hmm. many, so many good causes. Yeah. Yeah, there are. Mm -hmm. uh, well, for everyone who wants to support you, follow you, go on those trips, where can they find, follow, and connect with you? Oh, at AroundTheWorldNativeFabrics.com. Yeah. And then join our Instagram. Well, that'd be great because we do put a lot of effort into the Instagram and tell the maker stories. And I mean, <clears throat> the late breaking, we were just at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, which seems like a weird place for, for mm -hmm. a, a group like us. But we were partnered with Panasonic and we had these beautiful reception curtains that were dyed 12 shades of indigo and, um, and natural uh, um, Cotty Oaxaca cotton, and then this crazy biofabricated fiber fabric with Watanabe's indigo. So it was sort of all this technology, and then you could come into that space and say, "But this is, you know, this is connecting you to the soil, mm -hmm. and, love that, and to the plants." So, so that was some. So we do all sorts of interesting collaborations and partnerships. Mm -hmm. And then you can be part of that if you join Instagram, our our Instagram feed, and and um, and then join our newsletter. And yeah, so. I love it. Well, thank you so much for um, all the work that you do and the space you hold for the planet and all of its creatures and all of its people. Um, it, you know, it feels fills up my cup knowing that there are people like you doing incredible things and that you were generous enough to give your time to myself and the Powerful Ladies community today. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for your time. And yeah, I'm really excited to hear everyone's feedback and for more people to join and support around the world in AD Fabrics. Oh, it would be great. It'd be great. And thank you so much. It's it's quite an honor to join the cadre of people that you've, you've interviewed so far. Very fun talking to you. All the links to connect with Tierney around the world in 80 fabrics and everything else she's up to are in her show notes at thepowerfulladies.com. Please subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening and leave us a rating and review. Join us on Instagram at Powerful Ladies. And if you're looking to connect directly with me, visit caraduffy.com or kara underscore duffy on Instagram. I'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Until then, I hope you're taking on being powerful in your life. Go be awesome and up to something you love. Mm -hmm.